Hey, everyone. I'm Jason Weiser. And I'm Carissa Weiser. And you may know us from our award-winning podcast, Myths and Legends, but now we've partnered with Cast Media to create a new podcast called Scoundrel, History's Forgotten Villains, a series that tells the true stories of some of yesterday's most fascinating forgotten bad guys. For example, you'll follow the career of Sidney Gottlieb, not only learning that through Sidney and his CIA team, the U.S. literally sanctioned mind control experiments and torture. But the story will open a window allowing you to really feel what Cold War America was like. Each episode will feature a new villain and a new time period you may not have heard about, but really should. So if you like crime, evildoers, and the darker parts of history, join us on Cast Media's new podcast, Scoundrel, History's Forgotten Villains, every week, wherever you get your podcasts. The Colemans felt slighted by investigators. They felt their daughter's case was not being treated with any kind of urgency or diligence. So, with the help of Natasha, they requested numerous meetings with the GBI and filed petitions asking that Lot be taken off the case. In one such meeting with GBI Inspector Eve Rogers, the Colemans asked why the fingernail clippings hadn't been analyzed for potential DNA. And Inspector Rogers seemed to know nothing about them at all. She did not know anything about any fingernail clippings. The only thing that came out of that meeting was, and this is my understanding of what happened, is she requested that um, the special agent in charge, Mark Pro, go to the sheriff's department and locate those fingernail clippings, which he did. And the last information I heard was that they had been sent off for DNA processing. From Imperative Entertainment, this is Fox Hunter. The GBI did eventually get around to having a crime lab run tests to see if there was any DNA on the fingernail clippings in 2019, 29 years after Rhonda's death. And DNA was found. Because of the minuscule amount of DNA found, the GBI felt their best chance was to wait for the FBI's new $130 million state-of-the-art crime lab to go online with the most advanced forensics testing technology available in the United States. With delays caused by COVID, the Colemans are anxiously awaiting the results. As am I. Because if you'll remember, not only did Marky say he provided the GBI with his DNA sample, but I'm told by someone close to John that he did as well within the past few years. And that same source told me that while discussing Rhonda's case and this podcast recently, which he's been listening to, John admitted that he did see Rhonda at the Swanee Swifty the night of her abduction, though he claims that he left and went home afterwards. Of course, I want to know more about this. So once again, I try to reach John on the phone. I'm sorry, the person you are trying to reach has a voicemail box that has not been set up yet. Please try your call again later. Goodbye. Again, no luck in reaching John. Though it's clear to me now that since he's been listening along with the rest of you, he's made a clear choice to avoid speaking with me. And the same holds true for Rhonda's best friend, Treese, though I'm not sure why. If these people have nothing to hide, why would they not go on record and say as much? And there's another person I want to talk to, Rhonda's ex-boyfriend, Greg. I've been unable to locate even a working phone number. I even spoke with his mother, and she claimed to not have it. She told me Greg travels for work often and just calls her to check in. I sent messages to all the email addresses I could find, and I'm inclined to think that 
he's most likely aware of me and this podcast, and like John and Treese, has decided to avoid me like the plague. So I dug in my heels and tried to find anyone who had any information about Greg. And that led me to Gary Jacobs. Me and Greg are my best friends. I worked at Winn-Dixie here in Hazelhurst where it shut down. And uh, we played basketball on our days off. We ended up, because he worked in the market, and I was the assistant manager then. And uh, we just ended up our days off, and we had a lot of time, about two or three days every week to spend together. We loved to play basketball, and he's the toughest one I ever had to play against. Nobody ever beat me in a game except him, and then I'd beat him. It was always 50-50. But we'd do that, and then we'd go out and we'd drink beers. Gary worked at the same Winn-Dixie grocery store with Greg until he was transferred to another location in nearby Baxley, Georgia, several miles away. On the night of Rhonda's disappearance, Gary was woken by a strange sound outside of his house. Well, to start with that night, uh, I can remember it well. I'm going to check back on it. It was on uh, the day before it happened the night. There was NBA Finals, and back then I used to watch NBA because I love basketball, but I was watching Portland Trailblazers, and they didn't come on because they were on the West Coast until 1130. I, it was the same thing that night. I went to sleep. come on at 1130, and then about 1 o'clock before it would be halftime, and I did fall asleep. And I heard something wake me up, the motor racing. Nobody blew the horn. It was a motor racing in the back of my house. It's away from my bedroom. Nobody else would have heard it. And it's out there around the basketball goal where I always, we always played basketball. And, I, and then I sat up when I got enough awake, and I, I could hear a motor going by the side window in the living room, so I went to the front window because I knew they'd be there by then. And the street lights, I seen an old truck leaving. Greg had a Dodge Ram, a little Dodge Ram. And, but see, I hadn't been hanging around with Greg since I started work at uh, Baxter because we wasn't on, off on the same days and all, and I hadn't heard from him in two or three months, I guess. But when he'd always get, if he ever got any kind of trouble, he'd usually come to see me. And so I didn't think nothing else about it. At this time, Gary had not yet learned of Rhonda's disappearance and went back to sleep. I went on to work that morning, and I hadn't been there an hour when my wife called me and said, did you hear about Greg's girlfriend? And I said, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And they said, well, they found a car last night. It was running. Lights were on, the pocketbook, and everything was on the seat. And they're looking for her. They hadn't even found her yet. Don't know what happened. I said, oh, my gosh. When I got home that evening, I went by Greg's house. Talked to his daddy, because I hadn't seen him in a while. I knew he'd be upset. And when I pulled up, Greg's truck was gone, but his daddy was sitting on the porch. And I could tell he'd been crying, and he still was. He was teared up when I was talking with him. And I said, well, I'm so sure I'm sorry. I said, where's Greg at? He said, well, he's out there at her house now with her parents and all. And then we just got talking, a little small talk. A minute, he said something that just stuck with me. And he said um, he had just talked to her. She'd called him from the 2050. He said that Greg jumped in his truck and left after he talked to her. And he didn't know where he went. But I've often thought about that. Gary tells me that Greg lived just off the Bell Telephone Road, close to where Rhonda's car was found. And so when he told me that, then I knew. And it would have been easy when she left right then for them to meet up on that dirt road because where it was, it wasn't a mile from his house. And she was still the one that's 50 leaving. Gary was introduced to Rhonda by Greg when the two were dating. He eventually went to work at the same Piggly Wiggly grocery store that Rhonda worked at, and the two became friends. She was always talking if she worked at night, and one night we was talking there, and she said, uh, she knew we was close. And I said something about him, and she said, you know, he thinks the world of you. And I said, I do him too. But she said, Gary, there's another side of him you don't know. you got to swear to me you won't tell this to anybody. She said, we went to the beach last weekend. And uh, she said he had gotten a ticket for drinking on the beach in an open container or something. 
that night when they went to the motel room, and she knew that the only two people ever been in the room where they was down there that weekend was him and her. And she said, Gary, some of my expensive jewelry is missing. It was stolen. And me and him had a big fight about that. That may have been the reason they broke up. I don't know. I never found that out. She said that, he said, you better not come back to Hazelhurst and tell that to anybody, and especially Gary. She said, Gary, if you seen how mad he was, he didn't want you to know anything bad about him. Gary slowly began to see his friend Greg in a different light, shortly after Rhonda's body was recovered from a field in Montgomery County. They said Montgomery County, and Montgomery County is the edge of it. There's a trailer that Greg rented from our district manager, and we go down there and drink beer a lot and fish and mess around. And it's Old River Road, and that's where all from that, that's where she was found. And the only time I'd ever been to that spot was with him. The thought began to creep into the back of his mind. Was that Greg in the dark blue truck outside of his house that night? A small part of him wondered if it could have been Greg wanting to ask his friend for help or advice, but deciding not to and speeding off instead. I think probably he might have been just scared to death if it was him. Until to this day, I don't know that it was. Immediately following Rhonda's funeral, Greg went to Gary's house where a few other friends were preparing to barbecue. The two drove to the Winn-Dixie to grab another steak for Greg, who sat inside the truck while Gary went inside. Patrons of the store began to flock to the windows to gawk at Greg. So I went back outside and had a steak. He said, what were they saying? I just told him, I said, what they saying? You killed Rhonda. And he just dropped his head down and just shook his head, but he never said nothing one way or the other. A close friend of Milton's recently came to him with information about Greg as well. This person preferred not to speak directly to me, but stated to Milton that he did go to the GBI with this information many years ago. This man claims that on the night Rhonda disappeared, shortly after 1 a.m., he received a call from Greg, who he was friends with at the time, asking if he'd seen Rhonda. But when Milton and Deputy Leroy Sanders visited Greg's house, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1 a.m., they were told he was sleeping, and his mother wouldn't wake him because he had to go to work early. The source also told Milton that Several days after receiving the phone call, he received something else. A card in his mailbox, with no stamp or return address. On the card was simply written, Silence is golden. And it was signed, Greg. Though this man says he is 98% sure the handwriting was Mickey's, who he knew as well. Mickey, if you'll remember, also received a note in his mailbox. And Emily Beecher identified the handwriting as John's. So was someone simply playing sick pranks on these people? Or were there one or more people working together to throw investigators off track? But what about the investigation today? Where are we? What are police and GBI doing to solve this case now? As for the Jeff Davis County Sheriff's Department, Why did Preston Bohan and the Sheriff of Jeff Davis County remove his investigator from the case. Yes, Jeff Davis County is a small office. They don't have a lot of resources, but they could advocate for one of their citizens who was murdered. The sheriff doesn't even have an investigator assigned to this case. His statement to Milton was, well, when I get evidence, I pass it along to the GBI. Why is he not following up on that evidence to see if it's been processed or if these people have been followed up on? Is he checking to see if these witnesses have been questioned? What the witnesses are telling us is nobody's talking to us, not the GBI, not the sheriff's office, nobody. At a minimum, if the sheriff's office doesn't want to investigate it, they should at least advocate for one of their citizens and the families that still live here and follow up monthly, weekly, whatever it takes. Call the GBI, say, what's going on with the Rhonda Sue Coleman case? Is there something my department can do? Nothing's being done. How many free trial subscriptions end up costing you hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, long after forgetting to cancel? Fight back against scammy subscriptions with Truebill. 
Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 per year with Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions so hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. And your Truebill concierge is there when you need them to cancel any unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. Truebill has over 2 million users and helped save them over $100 million. Like Jennifer B., who says, With your help, our family has saved $587 per year on unnecessary subscriptions. I really didn't understand how Truebill could help me until we decided to save for a very large home purchase. So don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash true crime. Go right now. Truebill.com slash true crime. It could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash true crime. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Well, of course you would. After all, who doesn't love a great deal, right? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life, GEICO can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, the easy-to-use GEICO mobile app available 24-hour roadside assistance and more. And choosing to switch to GEICO becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you can save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to Geico.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. As for the GBI, I was actually contacted by an agent in September after Jody Ponzel asked if I'd be willing to turn over the information I'd gathered in the past year to assist the GBI in their investigation if possible. Jody now works as the lead investigator for the district attorney's office in Brunswick, Georgia, which oversees Jeff Davis County. And of course, I did turn over several audio recordings and interview transcripts after making sure the people I interviewed were comfortable with speaking to the GBI. In all, I gave the GBI 14 leads, some of which were not included in the podcast because I felt that they could give potential suspects or witnesses time to change their stories as well as to protect the identities of other witnesses. I also offered the polygraph readouts on Mitchell Wood and Rat by giving the GBI the contact information of Patrick Coffey at Metro Atlanta Polygraph. As of now, the GBI has yet to conduct interviews with all but one witness, and they have not requested the polygraph results. Milton, as well, has relayed credible information recently to the GBI and has verified that Like my leads, they've gone unchecked. It feels like the same old battle the Colemans have been fighting for over three decades. And why? What is it that's preventing investigators from taking these people seriously? From following up on leads, if only to discredit them and include that in Rhonda's case file. There's been evidence that has not been followed up on, just like with the fingernail clippings, you have these witnesses that have come forward who have been polygraphed and have all passed polygraphs who have not been contacted by the GBI except for one. I think they did speak to one witness. They have never contacted me to request copies of the polygraph results that we had done on the Thompsons. We've had people who brought evidence to us. We passed it along to the GBI. They've never been contacted. They're not doing anything, and it's it's been highly, highly upsetting to the family. Milton, though a little more reserved than Natasha, feels the sting of this, too. They haven't even bothered to request a polygraph, and we give them permission to get them. I'm pretty upset about that, because I say, I mean, we're giving them the evidence, and they don't seem like they're following up on it. It seems seems like to me they're dragging the feet, because they just... Something's not showing up. I mean, there's not adding up. Something just ain't right. I tend to agree with Milton on this. From everything I've seen and heard in the past year of my own investigation, something isn't right here. Maybe the GBI has no interest in these leads because they have some evidence we don't know about. It's possible, and I hope that's the case. But if so, 
why hasn't an arrest been made in 31 years? I haven't seen what's in Rhonda's case file, and access to information has been near impossible to get. And believe me, I've tried. I've requested information from the FBI through their Freedom of Information Act, and hand to God, I received a letter back from the FBI stating, potentially responsive records were identified during the search. However, we were advised that they were not in their expected locations. An additional search for the missing records also met with unsuccessful results. Basically, there should be FBI files on Rhonda's case, but they're missing. I also sent numerous requests to the GBI for any information through Georgia's Open Records Act and was advised each time that because this is an open and active investigation, nothing could be provided to me. Okay, I get that. I'm John Q. Public. But even the Colemans can't access any information on their daughter's murder case and what, if anything, is being done to solve it. Since this case is still considered an ongoing investigation, the GBI likely doesn't want this information to be made public. Do they have a suspect or suspects in mind? Are they close to an arrest? We don't know, and they won't tell us. So I got to thinking. There must be some information that I or the Colemans are able to access. Otherwise, what good is the Open Records Act, whose mission statement reads in part, Public men and women are amenable at all times to the people. They must conduct the public's business out in the open. The Georgia Constitution states that public officials are servants of the people. When checking religiously to see if I had received any further emails from the GBI, it dawned on me that these agencies correspond through email, like the rest of the world. Maybe I can at least see if the case is being discussed internally. I sent a formal request to the district attorney's office in Brunswick, Georgia, and the GBI asking for any emails, documents, letters, or memoranda, anything mentioning Rhonda's name. I received a response shortly after, stating the same I'd heard before. Essentially, it's an open case, you're shit out of luck. But I didn't give up. I called the district attorney's office personally and asked again. Again, I was told no, and in a very polite way of pawning me off on someone else to be their problem, I was told I could try calling the prosecuting attorney's counsel. They handle the email servers for different agencies, and maybe I'd have more luck there. So I called. I was told, once again, that because it's an open case, I would likely have access to nothing. And it would cost and be expensive to have an attorney search for these records. Okay. A day or two later, I receive an email from them. I prepare to read the same response I've gotten numerous times before, though this time I see an attachment in the email. I click it, and a file opens containing over 60 pages of emails between the GBI, the district attorney's office, legal teams, and the prosecuting attorney's counsel. And what I saw and shared with the Coleman family contained within these emails, to me, is nothing short of infuriating. We know from the memos and the emails that Jackie Johnson's office was given a copy of Rhonda's case file, that a copy of that case file was taken out of the Baxley office, possibly by the current sitting sheriff of Athlon County, Martin Melton, and he's possibly uh, in possession of a copy of her case file. You've got all of these people who've been given access to the case file, but you've got a sitting DA here who has been denied access. Per the emails, he had to go all the way up to the GBI's legal division and fight the inspector to get access to that file. Why does the inspector of the GBI not want a sitting DA to look at Rhonda Sue Coleman's case to see if a prosecution could be made? Jackie Johnson is the district attorney who previously held the office Keith Higgins now holds. She was recently indicted for preventing two Glynn County police officers from arresting one of her investigators, Travis McMichael, for his role in the murder of Ahmaud Aubrey in February of this year. John B. Johnson, the top prosecutor under Jackie Johnson, of no relation, was also forced to resign last year and is currently under investigation for misconduct 
and withholding evidence from the defense he was legally required to share in multiple cases, resulting in several innocent people potentially being sent to prison for life. One of the verdicts has already been overturned and the wrongfully imprisoned has been released. I'm told there's a blood relation between John B. Johnson and GBI Inspector Eve Rogers. But the question Natasha and the Colemans are asking is a valid one. Why would the GBI deny access to the case file on a murder that took place 31 years ago to a sitting district attorney, who is the only one who can make an indictment? And he cannot do that if he cannot first review the case file. In an email I obtained to the GBI's legal division dated October 21st of this year, District Attorney Higgins states, By not providing me with the current case file, the GBI is refusing to share relevant prosecutorial information. He then goes on to say, for me to do my job, I need the file. And there's more. Not only is there an internal memo stating that in a meeting between the GBI and the district attorney's office that took place on September 22nd, Inspector Rogers admitted, quote, Mistakes have been made in the Rhonda Sue Coleman case by the GBI, but also in an email dated October 19th, in plain black and white, Inspector Rogers tells the DA's office that the GBI's legal division has advised her department against releasing Rhonda's case file to them until it is ready for prosecution. Though I imagine that would be hard to do without seeing Rhonda's file. In yet another email, Dating October 21st, the GBI's legal department responds and refutes what Rogers had claimed and stated that, quote, Inspector Rogers was not authorized to speak on behalf of the GBI, as the GBI legal division has no official opinion on such matters. I think at this point we have an internal memo with the GBI admitting that mistakes were made in this case. That's coming from an inspector. I think the family needs to know, I think Milton and Gail have a right to know what those mistakes were, what those mistakes are, what mistakes have been made. I think they need to know why Inspector Eve Rogers and the GBI attempted to block Keith Higgins from having access to Rhonda Sue Coleman's case file. We know that Keith Higgins pushed back and was finally able to get access. Why? Does the GBI not want this case looked at when they gave Jackie Johnson's office, the former DA, access to the case file? The GBI did eventually offer access to the case file if someone wanted to view it in their regional office in Douglas, Georgia, a two-hour drive each way from Brunswick. I ask you, how accessible is that, really? And maybe that's the whole idea that it will be such an inconvenience that the problem will simply go away. We all want love, that happily ever after feeling of finding your soulmate. What if someone not only claimed they could help you find that perfect partner, they guaranteed it? Jeff and Shalia, a young couple famous on YouTube, teach about twin flames, a deep romantic connection with your perfect ultimate partner in their videos. It's a divine love. You're designed for no one else, and they're designed for no one else. But the path to finding your twin flame isn't so simple. Those who start to doubt the group are instructed to cut ties with friends and family that are holding them back and to corner and claim their twin flame through stalking and intimidation. By the time some members are able to leave the group, they don't even recognize themselves and the harassment to rejoin makes them fear for their safety. From Wondery, Twin Flames is a podcast about what happens when the quest for love turns into a dangerous obsession. Follow Twin Flames on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. Normally, it's a joint investigation with your local law enforcement and the state GBI agent. Now the GBI's got 100% control because the sheriff pulled out of it. So now nobody's checking on the GBI to see 
if they are following up on this information. That's the kind of questions that need to be answered for the family and frankly for the public. This doesn't only affect Rhonda's case. Look at what's happened to these other unsolved homicides in Jeff Davis County. You have so many homicides in this county that have remained unsolved. It's not only our family fighting for justice, you've got other families out there fighting for justice as well who are having to hire their own PIs to investigate them. And unfortunately, some families don't have access to those kind of funds to do it, and they shouldn't have to. The GBI, the state of Georgia, your local sheriff's department, and your DA's office should be advocating for every victim. The only person who's advocating for the victims of Jeff Davis County right now is Keith Higgins, newly elected DA, and he's getting roadblocked at every avenue by bureaucracy. And I don't know if this fight with the GBI is because they're mad at the family for questioning their ability to solve this case, But I think this podcast has shown and those emails and internal memos that you were able to obtain shows that they're not capable and they're not doing what needs to be done to solve this case. And I think the public needs to hold the GBI, the Sheriff's Department and whoever else is involved in holding up these cases need to hold them responsible because it needs to end. Families deserve closure. How many other families have gone and will go through the same misery the Coleman's have for years? How many other victims' families are fighting to simply find out what happened to their loved one? Are Milton and Gail destined to live out the rest of their days asking questions that could be answered with a simple phone call? It's absurd that in the one year of investigating for this podcast, they've had to learn new information from me. And that is one reason that Milton and Gail Coleman have begun working to institute a new law that will protect families from having to endure decades of waiting for answers, of not being told the status of the investigation of their loved one's murder case, of being kept in the dark indefinitely with nowhere to turn. Though currently in its infant stages, the law they are proposing, Rhonda's Law, would assist victims' families in obtaining information about their loved one's death, even in open cases, after a period of 20 years. Additionally, this proposed law would allow for an independent review board, composed of law enforcement agents, to review homicide case files to ensure that the GBI and or law enforcement have taken any and all measures available to solve said case, and to ensure that all evidence has been processed for forensic testing if available. And finally, Rhonda's law would ensure that district attorneys would have unfettered access to any and all active homicide investigation case files to ensure that no lesser and included charge becomes time barred due to a statute of limitation. And I think 20 years is, if you wait 20 years for a, for an answer, I think, I think they should be able to sit down and, and provide at least some part of an answer. Less than 20 years ago, you know, Milton and I could go ahead and process it in our minds and, and, and go on. But still, we're still living 31 years later with answering just simple questions. And families need to know. To find out more about Rhonda's Law and sign the petition, visit change.org and search for Rhonda's Law. Or visit foxhunterpodcast.com for more information. When I began Fox Hunter, I don't know how I ever expected this project to turn out, but it wasn't like this. Of course, I hoped that some information would come out that would help make an arrest. And maybe that will still happen. I'm hopeful, but we aren't there yet. And until it's over, I mean, really over, and we can have that celebration in the Coleman's front yard, as Gail wishes for, I'll keep answering the tip line and the emails and messages. The reward fund the Coleman started thanks to so many wonderful people in their community and those listening to this podcast. Donations and pledges have now brought the reward fund to over $160,000. 
The community has rallied to support Milton and Gale in ways no one could have foreseen. By selling bracelets, yard signs, t-shirts, organizing donation drives and yard sales, and have staged candlelit prayer vigils in Rhonda's honor and memory. A large billboard bearing Rhonda's face in downtown Hazelhurst serves as a constant reminder that until there is justice for Rhonda, we will not stop. And that in itself is a beautiful thing. Rhonda's story has also unintentionally helped to raise awareness of Don Walsh's fight for answers in his father's death. Currently, he's working to have the district attorney review the evidence he's found supporting the theory that his father did not die of carbon monoxide poisoning, but was in actuality murdered. And that murder was covered up by local law enforcement. We don't know if the GBI has a suspect or suspects that they're questioning now, or if they will interview the names we've discussed in this series, or they're close to making an arrest. We just don't know. But we do know that Rhonda's killer is likely still out there. We await the results of the DNA test, a potential game changer in this case that could provide real answers to finally give the Coleman's closure and hopefully result in an arrest. The waiting game is real, but 31 years is just too long to wait, to keep holding on to that little bit of hope. The Coleman's and the community of Hazelhurst want answers, and they want them now. And just like they did 31 years ago when Rhonda was senselessly murdered, the town has come together once again. And I'm proud to have played some small part in that. It's an honor. It's also worth noting that just days after I obtained these emails and documents through the Prosecuting Attorney's Council, of which the GBI was made aware, I received on December 9th an email from the GBI letting me know as a courtesy they were now in the process of contacting and following up with leads I had provided to them. One witness has confirmed to me that they were interviewed today by agents. It feels as if we're moving in the right direction. And now, when I look up at Rhonda's picture, which still hangs above my computer screen, I hope she can see all of this. I hope, wherever she is, she can feel the love that so many have for her, that she knows she is missed and that she will not soon be forgotten. And I hope she knows that I've tried my best to help her. I hope. Now that I'm a father myself, it's become more important to me than ever to be a voice for the voiceless, to champion stories like Rhonda's whose parents should never have had to outlive their child. And one day, if I'm lucky, my son will bury me. And in parting to whoever is responsible for robbing this beautiful young woman of her future, her hopes and dreams, and her life, I'm speaking to you. I hope you can hear my voice. I hope you've heard the anguish and pain in the voices of Milton and Gail Coleman and know that you've robbed them of the one thing that cannot be replaced, a future that would never come to pass. I hope that when you close your eyes at night, it's Rhonda's face that you see. I hope that when you're alone in a quiet place, lost in thought, it's Rhonda's voice that torments you. And if that should be, may you live a long, long life. Fox Hunter is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was created, written, and reported by me, Sean Kipe, and I wrote the original music score. Executive producers are Jason Hoke and Gino Falsetto. Story editor is Jason Hoke. 
Sound engineering by Shane Freeman. Key cover art provided by Joe Freeman Jr. Keychalis 9032, 2015. JoeFreemanJr.com. Fox Hunter is available every Tuesday morning. Follow us on social media at Fox Hunter Podcast. If you like the show, leave us a review and tell your friends. Thanks for listening.